the greatest opportunities in life are when you take the risk. And I always say it's you know akin to jumping out of an airplane. Um, I've never done that, by the way. But you know you don't have to jump out of an airplane. You know you can live a very happy life without doing that. But if you want the exhilaration of and the experience, then you got to be willing to lean forward and let go. She's the president and CEO of the National Public Broadcasting Service, PBS. Meet Paula Kerger, visiting from Virginia, next on Long Story Short. One-on-one, -on -one engaging conversations with some of Hawaii's most intriguing people. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox. Aloha mai kako. I'm Leslie Wilcox. My guest is a fellow president and chief executive officer in public television on a much larger scale. Paula Kerger heads the Public Broadcasting Service, PBS. Headquartered in Arlington, Virginia, the national nonprofit media organization provides wide ranging, high quality programming for more than 330 locally owned public television stations, including PBS Hawaii. During Kerger's tenure, PBS has markedly grown its audience and brought to American homes the blockbuster television series Downton Abbey on Masterpiece, the Vietnam War film by Ken Burns and Lynn Novick, and the educational children's series Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. Kerger has led PBS since 2006, making her the longest serving CEO in the organization's history. Before her grown-up ventures in public service fundraising and educational media, Kerger spent her childhood in a country town outside Baltimore, Maryland. There, a special family member taught her a thing or two about responsibility and serving others. I had no idea what I wanted to do when I was a kid. I loved being outside. I loved animals. So actually, my first idea was that I wanted to be a veterinarian because uh, I loved you know, working with animals. We had dogs and cats. I had a horse when I was little. How old were you when you had a horse? And that's every, I mean, this is a stereotype, but many, many girls dream of having oh, a horse. I think, I think most girls dream of having a horse. And, and you know, the thing was my, um, my aunt um, had horses and I was very close with her. She and I are only about 12 years apart. So she, in many ways, was more like a sister to me. And, um, you know, so I rode from the time I was little. I have pictures of me probably, you know, a year or two sort of propped up on the horse behind her. And so every year, like for Christmas, horse was my Christmas list. That was actually all I asked for. And so I think I was like 11 or 12, 12 maybe when I got the horse. And I got the horse at that age because my parents felt that I was old enough that I would be responsible for taking care of it. And it was, I think that, you know, I'm not suggesting every parent go out and buy their child a horse, and we lived in the country. I kept the horse at home, but every morning before I went to school, I had to carry heavy water buckets down to the barn and, um, you know, feed the horse, put the horse out, you know, bring it back at night, brush it, and take care of it. And I think that kind of responsibility, I mean, it, you can do this with goldfish um, <laughs> as well, but I think, you know, whatever it is, I think that there's something about having that kind of responsibility, particularly when you're young. The other thing about horses that are interesting is that they're really large animals. And I think that especially for girls, it's empowering. You know, you, you know, you, girls develop deep bonds with their horses. I certainly did with mine. And, um, you know, both the, um, you know, the freedom of being able to ride and, you know, to have this relationship with, with an animal that you, you're not controlling in the same way that, you know, I think sometimes you might be tempted to try to control other things in your life. You, you develop mutual respect. And that's what I think is also was really important in, in, um, in my relationship with my horse. Did you name your horse? My horse came with a name, and his name was Raven. This was before the football team. Uh, but um, he, was, uh, he was really, he was wonderful. Can you see how that um, discipline and that relationship translated to your later life? Yeah, I mean, I think that I, um, I think I'm a highly responsible person. And um, I think part of that is you, you learn those lessons early. When you have the responsibility of a horse or a dog or an animal, or I mean, I don't mean to put children in the same bucket, but when you have the responsibility for someone or something else, that has to come before you. And so, you know, I, you know, there were many afternoons that, you know, I would want to, you know, 
do something with my friends or you know maybe just stay inside and read or whatever but when someone is counting on you or something is counting on you that has to come first and I think that's a really important lesson to learn at a, at a young age that sense of something larger than me. One of the biggest human influences in Paula Kerger's life was her grandfather, who lived next door to her childhood home in rural Maryland. His diverse interests and skills set the stage for what would come much later for Kerger. Grandfather was a professor, and so he was a scientist, uh, but he was also a great artist. And I think that those two pieces of him uh, really influenced me a lot. He, he right brain, left brain. Yeah, exactly. He really helped kindle my interest in, in science. He was a physics professor, and so he did a lot of work in, um, in microwave technology. In fact, he started the public radio station in Baltimore. And so I think my, my path into public media uh, was perhaps destined because of, of his influence. But he also was involved with the local, local theater and uh, he was involved in all the tech work. Uh, but he was a great storyteller. Some of my greatest memories when I was a kid uh, was sitting with him and he would just spin these amazing stories, make-believe stories about animals in the woods and all these other kind of things. And it's just, um, you know, I, I, I just think it was probably one of the most uh, fundamental formational things for me is growing up with someone that, you know, that had that great creativity that shared that with I'm me. I'm sure grandparents who hear this will be very pleased. Yeah. And your parents, what were they like? My mother uh, worked out of the home and my father was an engineer. And so um, he also was very, you know, science-based. He, um, he was more of a authoritarian type. Um, he went to the Citadel, so, which is the West Point of the South, for those that don't know what that is. And hardcore discipline. Very hardcore discipline. And so I think that's also where my grandparents actually then came in. They were the refuge. As, as I think as often with kids. You know, the parents are the ones that set all the rules and the grandparents are ones that bend to them a little bit. But, uh, uh, but I grew up in a house where uh, music was really important. Uh, we had a lot of Broadway show albums and we listened to music a lot. And uh, we were very engaged in the community. My, both of my parents were very big volunteers. And so from the time that I was little, I was involved in everything from going door to door to raise money for the Heart Fund to my, my father was a football coach. And so, you know, I would uh, probably the most mortifying thing I ever did when I was a kid is when can uh, practice was canceled because of the weather, he would give me a list of all the boys to call to tell them they didn't have to show up for practice and most of them were about my age and it was just mortifying <laughs> to have to go through and call everybody at home and say, you don't have to come to practice today, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Now speaking of the make-believe stories your grandfather told, the schools you attended in that rural area also sound like a make-believe land. I know. Featherbed so, Lane I went to Elementary. Featherbed <laughs> Lane Elementary. It's like, where did you go to school? I went to Featherbed Lane Elementary, and then uh, and then Johnny Cake Junior High. So, but Johnny Cake. Where does that name come from? So Johnny Cake Junior High. Johnny Cakes uh, were something. This all goes back actually to the. In the case of Featherbed Lane, I think that's probably more Revolutionary War, but you know, um, but Civil War. You know, and Johnny Cakes were something that were made that actually soldiers carried in their in their packs. And I think that, you know, people find them so unusual, but I think it's a reminder that that part of the country, Maryland, is one of the original colonies, has a very different history than Hawaii. And uh, and so I think part of even the names of those schools are reflective of of a of a of a, of a different uh, of a different culture. Yeah. And what was high school? High school was a normal named high okay. school. I went to Randallstown High School and Randallstown was the adjacent town. So that's like a regular school name. <laughs> After high school, Paula Kerger's love of science and animals inspired her to work toward becoming a veterinarian. But things didn't quite pan out the way she wanted. Veterinarian school, at least now, is, is harder to get into than med well, school. Well, that is what happened when I entered college because I realized as I was applying to college that how difficult it was going to be uh, to become a veterinarian. So when I applied to college, I actually applied for pre-med. 
And um, I have an uncle that's a pediatrician, and I have a great, uh, I think she must be a great aunt who was a very early doctor. So, um, you know, so I also had a little bit of that in my family, and I thought, okay, I may not be able to get into veterinary school, but maybe I can get into medical school. I mean, how weird does that sound? But anyway, <laughs> so I started, um, I started pre-med, and, um, and I really loved it until I hit organic chemistry, which I failed. And I, you know, it's the great leveler, I've come to find out. That's so and true. How many people have said that? Yeah, it organic chemistry. And then suddenly I was in an existential discussion in my head about my future. And I decided that um, I would take a lot of humanities classes because I was really interested. I loved, uh, from the time I was little, I've loved to read. And in fact, one of my earliest memories was getting my library card. And my town was small. We didn't even have a library. We had the bookmobile. And I remember going to the bookmobile. And you had to be able to sign your name to get a library card and practicing and practicing so I could get my library card. And then, you know, the whole world opened. And so I've always loved to read. So I took a lot of, um, you know, literature classes. I took some comparative r religion classes and, and so forth. And I just, I, it was, you know, it was just great. But then I thought, I'm going to live in my parents' house for the rest of my life because there's no job that I'm preparing myself for. So I went into business school. And I um, I had been working. I started working when I was 16. My first job was at McDonald's. Um, and I'd worked through college. And I'd worked for a group of banks. And I, um, I didn't really think I wanted to work in finance. But I knew that if I had a business degree, I was really interested in marketing. And I thought, you know, maybe there's some path in there some way. I graduated from school with my business degree, not a clue what I was going to do with my life. And I tell kids this all the time because I think a lot of kids think that you need to have your life planned out. And I was, you know, I had this now checkered college career. All of my, you know, really difficult science courses that all counted as electives. I had this, you know, um, I'd taken other cl classes that I think you know, ultimately, it's funny when I back up and look at my my college life. I, I actually have a pretty well-rounded, you know, generalist degree based on all the things I did. But you know, I started looking for a job, and at the time, in the one ads, and I mostly was looking for marketing jobs. And I went on some pretty terrible interviews. And one day, I stumbled on a on an ad in the newspaper for a job working for UNICEF in Baltimore, which is where I'd grown up. And I went and interviewed for the job. I was completely unqualified for the job. It was running their office in Baltimore. But the, uh, the guy that interviewed me called me back. And he said, you know, you're not qualified for this job, but would you be interested in coming to Washington and working for UNICEF with our, in our office there? And I took that job. And it was just, uh, it was just an amazing moment because I never realized you could work in the nonprofit sector. I thought that's just something you did. I thought that you know you volunteered and you did these things to pay back, but it just never. I'd never really put the pieces together that there were actually people in those organizations that, you know, that actually managed them and did the work. Paula Kirker's nonprofit career would take her to New York City, where she'd always dreamed of living. After working in fundraising at several nonprofit organizations, including the Metropolitan Opera House, she received a challenging and life-changing job offer to head fundraising at the New York City flagship PBS station, WNET. At the time, the station was going through financial woes. They had started a big capital campaign. Our station in New York had had a lot of difficulties. They'd gone through a couple layoffs. And I thought, you know, this is going to be a very difficult job. And, you know, all the other jobs I had interviewed, I knew for sure that I was going to be successful in it. And this one I wasn't quite sure. Uh, again, they'd had all these financial issues, and it wasn't, I wasn't really clear um, that it was going to be successful. But I think oftentimes the greatest opportunities in life are when you take the risk. And I always say it's, you know, akin to jumping out of an airplane. Um, I've never done that, by the way. But you know, you don't have to jump out of an airplane. You know, you can live a very happy life without doing that. But if you want the exhilaration of and the experience, then you've got to be willing to lean forward and let go. And you don't get there by yourself. A lot of people help you. And um, I imagine that it has to be the most amazing experience. And you don't have to ever do it again, by the way. But, you know, it also can change your life. And so for me, it was that job. You know, I took the job, and it was really difficult. But it, it changed my life. I did that work for a few years. We raised uh, 
significant amount of money for the station. And then I was starting to think about, oh, I wonder what I might do next. And the then president said, would you be interested in becoming our station manager? That was the second really risky uh, decision for me uh, because suddenly I was going to be the boss of people that had been my colleagues. And that's the hardest, I think, career change when you move into a role where suddenly you're a different relationship with people that had been peers. And it was really hard, but coming into public television was hugely important. That probably was the pivotal move because it was from that position that I actually got the call to come to PBS. Now, there are very few people who run national organizations, especially those with a lot of constituencies. I mean, I mean, you have 330 or so public media stations that are members of PBS. Yeah. And, then, and then, of course, there are politics and there are filmmakers. And I mean, it's daunting. I mean, I can just imagine people saying, I could do this part of it, but not that, not this, and not all at the same time. It's, it's complicated, and, and I always say, you know, if you want a lesson in humility, run a federated organization, because that's how we're structured. I think a lot of people don't understand PBS. You're, um, essentially, it's a co-op. Yes, it's like a co-op. We're, we're a federated system, so every station is individual, locally owned, locally operated, locally governed. And many fiercely local. Fiercely local fiercely independent. And um, the stations themselves, as you know, formed PBS as an opportunity to bring together the resources and create scale across the entire country to invest in programming and content that would enrich all. So essentially, they're the bosses, but you lead them. Right. That's unwieldy. So a lot of responsibility, not absolute authority. The mission makes a big difference, but um, there are a lot of differences in how our 330 stations operate. Right, and as people travel around the country and see different stations, you see that not every public television station is exactly the same, which is what makes it, I think, such an unbelievably important and rich organization because we are absolutely anchored at the local level. And I think of this station in particular, you do so much great work that really Thank talks you. about this community and the people that are here and you're able to do that because you're from here. And the people that are in this station live here and are committed to making this community as vibrant and important as all the people that live here expect it to be. And that's what our best public television stations do. Your, your job right now is it's pretty much managing change, change yeah. in many aspects of the yeah. organization as you look at the country and media platforms. Yeah. And, uh, what people are interested in and how they communicate. Yeah. We are right now in an extraordinary sea change in media as there's so much change in the way that people are consuming content. And for those of our stations who are very have been very happy being just broadcast stations to be pushed to understand that, yes, people will watch programming on their television station, but they'll also stream and they'll also be able to acquire content in um, in multiple ways. The whole concept of broadcasting has been the whole vastly has expanded. Been completely stretched. And so to get people to agree that the world has changed and that we're gonna work together is uh, is complicated. And you can only do it if you build trust. And that's why the job, I've been in the job 14 years, to be honest, because it has evolved so much. When I first took this job, uh, Apple had announced that they were gonna sell episodes of Desperate Housewives for $1.99. And you think about that now, and it's like, oh, <laughs> that just, you know, that, that seems so it long seems, ago. It seems, yeah, exactly. It was exactly. not that long it ago. Seems, no Facebook, so long Netflix ago. was sending you discs in the mail. I mean, the world was completely different. And to encourage this whole generation of younger people that are coming into public media, to really think widely about what we can be is really exciting. PBS National President and CEO Paula Kirker says that being the head of an organization, especially one that reaches across the country and requires extensive travel, can be lonely. But she has support from a key person in her life. You can't be a leader and make everyone happy all the time. I mean, that's the... And again, I've talked to young people who are thinking about their careers, or actually as I've mentored people that are making career decisions, you have to be really honest about what it means to be a leader. It's lonely at times because you, you are very much aware that the buck stops with you. 
you also need to make the right decisions for the organization, and sometimes those are very hard decisions, particularly when it relates to other people. But you also need to be compassionate. You need to listen really carefully. I think you need to be able to make decisions. I see leaders fumble because they can't, you know, they need more information, more information. You're never going to have perfect information. But you need to be able to move with deliberate haste and be able to work with your team in charting a direction and provide that leadership. What does it look like to be this national leader with all these constituencies and uh, and a personal life and you've got external uh, stakeholders, you've got, you've got so many people within the system. Look, I was a first time CEO when I took this job and uh, I um, looked to people that I trusted, as I have through my entire career. Actually, I still do. Even 14 years into this job, you would think I know what I'm doing. I, I do think I know what I'm doing. But we're always coming into circumstances in our lives that are new and different and challenging. And so I think what has made the biggest difference for me and um, I, I think has really also contributed to the richness of my life is that I look to people that I trust, that I can talk to. Um, my husband is one. He's been my biggest proponent. Oftentimes when I've looked at jobs and haven't been sure. Is that, he in education or media? Well, he is, uh, he's a writer, uh, but, and he worked for Norman Lear years ago, but his, his advice is really more about me personally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that many of us, and I think unfortunately more women have a tendency to do this, is we hold ourselves back. We wait for someone to tap, tap our shoulder and say, here, we want you to take this opportunity or we will, we will tell you all the reasons why we're probably not the right person. As and you I, did in that job interview well, that you I've mentioned. Well, I've done multiple interviews. Let me tell you, you know, why I maybe am not the right person and not recognizing that no one interviews for a job that's perfect in every way. And, um, you know, he, is a, he is a, a, has been a, a great supporter of mine in part because of the way he was brought up. His father died when he was five and his mom was left with six kids. And her husband, it was a traditional family, didn't let her work, and suddenly she had six kids and no money. And he um, tells a story, which, you know, again, this is in our lifetime, Leslie. Um, she, had, she worked overnight, so she'd be home to put the kids on the bus to go to school. She wanted to get a credit card. And she went to the bank and, um, they asked if she had an uncle or a brother that could come and co-sign, because she was a woman. And she was at the bank with her 10-year-old son. And the bank officer said, I have an idea. My 10-year-old husband co-signed a credit card so she could get her first credit card. He's had that credit card ever since. I mean, he signed as a 10-year-old? As a 10-year-old. They allowed him was, to? Because he was a boy. Oh. And so um, I think that, you know, when and so when you come up like in that kind of story, and you watch your mother, you know, really struggling to put food on the table and to keep the family together, it changes you. And he has been my biggest advocate because he looks at me and he looks at what I've accomplished in my life and knows that um, I don't always get, even to this day, the benefit. I can't tell you how many events I go to and people say, oh, let me introduce you to the president of PBS and they shake my husband's hand. Still to this day, it to exists. This you day. and I both know this. And so I think that uh, we're blessed in our life if we have people that um, are our yes and he has very much been my yes. So that's probably the most personal story I can tell you. And you're always traveling or you're often traveling, you have long work hours, but that still works for you. A yeah. long time marriage. Long time marriage. With your high school sweetheart. With my high school sweetheart. And you know, it's look, I prioritize my life. And even as much as I love my job, my husband does come first. Life is all balance. Um, I believe that, you know, you have your professional life, which is important, but it is not your entire life. I think you have your personal life and your personal relationships, friendships, family. That is very important and that has to be cultivated and it doesn't just happen. I see a lot of people that get into trouble because they just assume family will always be there. You know, you have to nurture that relationship. Your physical self, I think, is really important. And your community self, what you give back. But I think that you don't always have it in the equal balance, but I think all of those pieces are what makes a whole person. And when I finally leave this world, I want to feel like I've made this world a little better 
which was the, the aha moment when I got my very first job and I realized I could earn a paycheck and actually feel like I've done something that made a difference. And that's really the core of me. Paula Kerger, president and CEO of the National PBS, is gamely navigating changes of many kinds in the media industry, including technology and media formats, generational preferences, increasing polarization of opinions, and funding sources. She wants young people who are trying to chart out the rest of their lives to know there's no such thing as a straight and narrow life path. Life, she says, is truly a journey. In her words, why would you close any doors? Mahalo to Paula Kerger, visiting Hawaii from the East Coast for sharing her story with us. And mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha Nui. So I was in um, International House. I got a call one day um, from a headhunter asking if I'd be interested in working at the Metropolitan Opera. Now, I love music didn't really know a lot about opera, but I've always wanted to work in the arts. And almost talked myself out of the job, you know, because when I went in the interview, I said, you know, I don't really know anything about opera, and I'm not sure I'm the best person for you to hire. This is not the way you should conduct an interview. And how old are you at this point? Oh, I was uh, 30, I guess. And, um, and the, the guy that was interviewing me, who was the head of development at the Met, said, you know, do you like, do you like music? Do you like opera? And I said, yes. I said, I, I just don't know as much as I'm sure other people that could be interviewing for this job. And he said, we don't want fans at the stage door. We want people that um, are really serious and that really are interested in this work. If one had asked when I was a kid, what would I have thought my career path working at the Metropolitan Opera? Of course not. I mean, that was just crazy. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. 